Uh, okay, I'll echo everybody's thanks also for the organizers and for inviting me. Um, I also want to remind you that uh, this project started as a case study. Uh, the ITEC also kind of mentioned a little bit on her prompting as well. And so I work very much bottom up. Uh, and actually, it's a wonderful opportunity for me here to have to see how I can more broadly contextualize this because I'm already from the previous presentations, I'm seeing where uh, uh, the international college that I will be talking about revises certain assumptions and where it fits with others and what kind of parallels um, it reveals. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to read it. Izmir, Smyrna, the American Protestant missionary's first outpost in the Ottoman Empire in 1820, and the printing center for its publications between 1833 and 1853, was also one of the last locations in the empire to acquire an American board college. Despite repeated attempts, financial constraints, continued resistance from local clerical authorities, especially Orthodox Greek and Armenian, and the lack of an established local Protestant community that could provide support precluded the missionaries from developing lasting schools in the city. Izmir's already well-endowed educational landscape, boasting numerous secondary schools and colleges, made it all the more difficult for the Protestants to carve out a place of their own. Only in the 1890s did the small boys' school, the outgrowth of a day school founded in 1838 by Maria West and continued by Reverend uh, Marcellus Bowen gained a firm footing. We established as the American High School for Boys in 1893 under the direction of its dynamic and ambition principal, ambitious principal, Reverend Alexander McLaughlin. The school grew to become the American Collegiate Institute for Boys in 1898, so this is just five years later, and was accredited as the International College of Smyrna by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 1903. This is another five years later. So within a decade, McLaughlin had transformed the school into a college with alumni granted automatic admission to institutions like MIT, the University of Chicago, and the University of Geneva. Building on these advances and aided by a momentous gift from the New York banker John Stuart Kennedy, who is a philanthropist in fact um, that is known for his generous contribution to the Met, to Columbia University in New York, and to Robert College in Istanbul. So, kind of aided by this momentous gift, McLaughlin moved the college from its limited inner city location to a new purpose-built suburban campus in Paradiso. Opened in 18, uh, sorry, in 1913, the new campus consisted of three main buildings, McLaughlin Hall, the auditorium, and the, and the gymnasium, Right they're organized around a vast open space in addition to a president's house and infinity facilities. This is campus. Right there, it almost reads as a diagram of the pedagogical intentions. Um, the college operated during deeply divisive times through World War I, the Greek occupation, and again during the new Turkish regime until 1934. Now, considering the many setbacks the educational mission had encountered in its early days, the college's upward trajectory and relatively uninterrupted course for its half century of existence in Izmir were no small feat. Lauded as one of the seven citadels of higher learning in Anatolia, the International College has received substantial attention as an outgrowth of the American board and its missionary work in the Ottoman Empire. But the college's rich and manifold associations with the city, its communities and physical settings, without which it could not have developed into the sought after institution it became, have largely been overlooked. Although the initial incentive and a large portion of the capital for the new campus came from American sources, it was McLaughlin's judicious positioning of the college at the nexus of American missionary and local supporters that allowed the institution to thrive over the years. To begin with, while incorporating the college under the Prudential Board in Massachusetts, McLaughlin also looked outside the mission for financial and administrative support, forming a local board of directors and making the college practically, if not fully, self-sufficient. He also creatively engaged with Ottoman authorities and practices to augment the college's physical facilities, 
strengthen its presence in the city and establish it as a good citizen locally. Moreover, an inclusive curriculum, well calibrated for the city's diverse and commercially oriented audience, weave the college into the local fabric and distinguish it within a crowded educational landscape. So in this paper, following a brief presentation of McLaughlin, what I want to do is to focus on these localized strategies that allow the college to develop its infrastructure and to articulate its academic and extracurricular programs. Viewed together, these strategies expose a synergetic relationship between the college and the city, a relationship which I contend ensure the success of the college during its operations in Izmir, but also spell its demise in 1934. That year, local tensions and the drastic loss of funding forced the college to relocate to Beirut. It was precisely the gradual destruction of this local ecology of carefully constructed networks of which the college was an integral part that dealt the final blow to the international college's existence in Izmir. So let me briefly turn to the college's legendary founder, Reverend Alexander McLaughlin, a Canadian of Scottish heritage who was instrumental in galvanizing both American and local backing for the college. First, unlike other missionaries who came to the Ottoman Empire as American board appointees, McLaughlin was already active in the empire when he joined the board in 1890 and had the advantage of personal ties to the city in which he was stationed. Having arrived to the empire in 1887 to establish the St. Paul's Institute in Tarsus with his Union Theological Seminary classmate, Reverend Taratun Jananyan, and having lost his first wife there, he remarried the Izmir-born Rosalind Cooper Blackwood. Soon after, the Izmir station enlisted him to direct the local boys' school, which had been lagging behind the girls' schools for some years. Rosalind's father, Francis Chipman Blackwood, who hailed from Boston, had settled in Izmir in the 1840s to facilitate family business in the East, a bicontinental arrangement not uncommon among merchant families in Izmir. The Blacklers were engaged in overseas shipping and trading and were members of the city's entrepreneurial elite. Their summer houses, or they had two in fact, in the suburban, uh, in the suburban village of Buja, neighbored those of Izmir's other prominent traders, many of whom were of European or American descent. Rosalind's brother, Francis or Frank, was a well-established merchant in the yarn and carpet trade, both prominent industries in Izmir, and also served as president of the American Chamber of Commerce in the Levant. Now, the Blackler's network afforded McLaughlin both insider knowledge and support from local businessmen, who were largely, but not exclusively, of Anglo-American and Protestant background. For example, among the 12 members of the college's local board of directors were Sidney Lafontaine, owner of a major carpet trading house, uh, he was of Huguenot extraction, Richard Whittall and Douglas Patterson, leading British, British merchants again in the carpet business, and Ezra Johnson Davy, standing American consul and Boston merchant who, like the Blacklers, owned a bicontinental business, as well as the chaplains of the British, Scottish, German community. Now, in addition to supervising the college's finances, the local board chipped in when American board subsidy, which hardly covered missionary salaries and basic maintenance, fell short. The local board also oversaw the curriculum, recommended and made new faculty hire, and covered their salaries from internal funds. Now that was the first point. The second point is that McLaughlin cultivated a friendly rapport with local Ottoman officials helping the college navigate bureaucratic obstacles and increase its visibility in the city. Although in financial and curricular matters, the college benefited from the freedoms and immunities granted to foreign institutions under the capitulations, in property-related matters, as well as construction and expansion permits, it came necessarily under Ottoman law. And as I'll expand in a moment, both during the expansion of the college at the Basmane property and its later relocation to Paradiso, McLaughlin's familiarity with Ottoman laws and his alliances with local authorities served him well. His ability to secure minimal governmental interference, if not outright support, helped the college further its presence in Izmir's cultural life, with student clubs, and the YMCA, and other activities. So before I zoom in on this uh, interdependent local ecology that I just quickly outlined, let me give you a sense of the physical premises. So um, okay. the original boys' school was located in a rented mansion, the Spartala House, 
on Mele Street, on the fringes of the American, uh, on, of the Armenian neighborhood, near the Basmani rail station and warehouse. Now, given the cramped inner city location, physical expansion was done piecemeal and continued pretty much until 1909. And here are diagrams showing the extent of college property by the time the campus reached its maximum limit. It reached its limit either due to railway sheds on two sides or city streets on the other, which prevented pretty much further growth. Now, Mele Street, um, um, okay, now the campus, let me also give you a quick sense of the campus. The campus included College Hall, familiar by now, the College Halls. This is the main building that you see here, which you also see here. Right next to it, you have the prep school, uh, and behind it, you have an auditorium, a uh, library, dining hall, structures and views of that period, and the dormitories for water and the And then, for um, courtyards and playgrounds, because we've been talking about athletics. Maybe I should point out a few things here. This is the central playground. Uh, this is like a secondary one. And this is a playground that was acquired um, specifically to turn into a soccer field. Um, now, McLaughlin's energetic recruitment, which grew the student body from 25 to over 250 students in the first decade of operation, meant that the school experienced a chronic shortage of space. Facing a frustrating lack of financial support from the American board, McLaughlin had to grow the facilities in an ad hoc, often opportunistic way, shrewdly tapping into his local connections. For example, he used his personal ties with Tech Force Spartala to purchase the house that served actually as college hall. Spartala, an Armenian carpet magnet, agreed to sell the property for two-thirds of its value in recognition of the work that missionary societies had been doing for needy Armenian children. Even then, the deal would have fallen through were it not for a cousin and childhood friend of Francis Blackler in Boston who furnished the necessary funds to the Prudential Board for the acquisition. A decade later, when the college received notice to evacuate the next-door property it leased as a dormitory, McLaughlin resorted to his tenants' preemptive rights uh, which is basically the priority afforded in Ottoman laws to a renter during the public sale. And without any backing from the American board, he used his personal savings and borrowed from local, uh, what he calls Presbyterian friends, uh, and that's the move which, in addition to the dormitory, made room for an assembly hall, dining room, and a general study hall. On another occasion, he used the Ottoman provision that permitted the gradual privatization of a cul-de-sac to consolidate college properties seamlessly, connecting the newly acquired football field uh, or soccer field to the main ground. And this was basically an alleyway that he kind of gradually incorporated and kind of made part of his, his property consolidation. Receiving um, oh, uh, one more actually, and similarly in 1905, the fire that burned down the prep school became a blessing in disguise receiving a generous compensation from the insurance company, whose local agent was no other than Matt Blackler's brother-in-law, uh, Frank Blackler, and raising additional funds from the local board, he turned the crisis into an opportunity to endow the college with a new and expanded facility. And this now, his experience in overseeing successful building projects allowed McLaughlin to become an important player in Izmir's municipal modernization project, further weaving him and his institution into the city's local social and physical fabric. The case in point was the street improvement project in 1908-1909 that enhanced the, uh, both the image of the college and the surrounding neighborhood. In the summer months, the Mele stream running through the middle of the street degenerated into an open sewer. Here, McLaughlin collaborated closely with the then mayor, Muammer Uşak Libyan, one of his older Turkish friends and businessmen with American and British connections, Mohamed Bey agreed to recommend an improvement project to his council so it would underwrite 60% of the cost. McLaughlin, in turn, enlisted all property owners on the street to contribute 40% of the cost, oversaw the construction, hiring and paying the workmen and the suppliers. On another, uh, in another case, modern equipment purchased for the college proved useful for local establishments, further reinforcing the interdependency between town and town. 
such were the seismograph and weather station, which included electric wind vane, um, rain gauge, and similar equipment gifted to the college by Ernest Patterson, brother of a local board member. And this is going to sound familiar, Maria just mentioned that, but daily weather reports and recordings of the frequent earthquakes in the Aegean region furnished data to local newspapers and weather bureaus around the world. Also, the daily noontime signal from the college tower proved so accurate that the local government, the, new, the two railway stations or railway lines serving Izmir and the ships calling at Izmir set their chronometers by the college's signal. As enrollment kept growing, especially after the institution was granted a collegiate charter and the campus reached its limits at the Basmane site, it became imperative to move to a more spacious site. Here too, the collaboration between town and gown continued with development relying on support from a mix of local patrons, overseas donors, and Ottoman authorities. As in previous building projects, McLaughlin mobilized his international connections to make the new campus a reality. A large part of the capital for the relocation came from the Kennedys that I mentioned earlier, whom McLaughlin had hosted during their visit to Izmir in 1893 and who remained supportive of his initiative over the years. Similarly, he seems to have obtained the blueprint for the main building, for the main college hall, from the prominent firm of Canadian architects who built the old arts building in Queen's University in Kingston, Canada, which was his alma mater prior to the Union Seminary. Meanwhile, for local matters, from construction supplies and expertise to logistics and site selections, he relied on his Smyrniot network. The local board assisted McLaughlin in securing low-cost material, lumber from Norway, stone from local quarries, cement from nearby Greek island, and organizing and overseeing workers and wages. Additional funds to complete the buildings and acquire equipment would come from the eventual sale of the substantial real estate assets that McLaughlin had consolidated at Bachmane. The local board also selected the 20-acre site for the Paradiso campus, first because of its distance uh, from the corrupted effect of the city that Maria mentioned earlier, but also for its easy access from the train station. The train ride from Izmir was only 10 minutes which ensured continued enrollment of day students necessary for the survival of the institution. Um, maybe this is a little more cynical, but the campus was also not far from the summer houses of the board members. I don't know to what extent that is considered. But another important consideration, second, I would say, overlooking the vast Sadiqoy plain with its numerous orchards and groves, the site had the potential to become an agricultural campus. Indeed, Within a decade, the agricultural program was launched with the assistance of local benefactors who acquired large tracts of adjacent farmland known as West Farm and South Farm, furnishing them with dairy and poultry buildings, an apiary, and related equipment for fruit and vegetable farming. Unlike previous expansions at Basmani, the transfer of the college to a new site and the erection of brand new buildings required an imperial firman, or an imperial order. McLaughlin resorted to the same kind of network, now further bolstered by supportive alumni and parents. Izmir's mayor in 1911-1912, uh, Dr. Etambe, whose son had been at the college for some years, favorably recommended the move, while Grand Vizier Kamil Pasha, whom McLaughlin knew from when he was governor of uh, Izmir, gave him verbal assurance, allowing him to proceed with construction long before the actual firman materialized, actually took three years to get it, so construction was almost done by then. Throughout its existence, the college continued to share its technology, creating mutually beneficial exchanges with local establishments. For example, its state-of-the-art electric plant supplied power to illuminate the Paradiso station at night, while the railway company added additional trains to accommodate the college's teaching schedule. Now, to appreciate the rapid growth of the college, we also need to understand how it recruited its students and what kind of curriculum it offered. As a latecomer in a crowded educational field, the college had to hold its own among a host of well-established secondary schools and colleges. And actually, thanks to Tassos you know, for providing a taste of this kind of competitive landscape. So in the case of Izmir, the majority of these uh, were community or government schools, 
So you have the Greek Evangelical College, the Armenian Secondary Schools, the Alliance Schools, uh, the Rishkiyas and Idadis um, that uh, Ben mentioned yesterday. Uh, but several were also run by long-standing Catholic missions. Among them was the Collège de Propagande, Collège du Sacré-Cœur, École des Frères, Mekitari School, just to name a few. And others were run by laymen, the British Commercial School, the British College, the, Bur the Burnabat English College. Now, some of these institutions were open to all. Others admitted specific religious or linguistic groups. Some prepared the youth for commercial careers others for admission to universities, and many provided boarding and half-boarding facilities. But given Izmir's mercantile environment, all of them offered a mixture of languages and some bookkeeping. Now, to keep pace with and forge ahead in this educational landscape, McLaughlin introduced new principles departing from the model set by his missionary associates in Izmir. First, to place the college on a stable financial basis, he ended the practice of waiving school fees to children of Protestant parents, or to children of parents of, mother, of meager means, imposing instead higher and full tuition rates on all applicants. Second, from the outset, and despite limited physical facilities, he made sure to offer a boarding section that brought students from outside Izmir and helped sustain a healthy enrollment. Third, and importantly, he insisted that the college, although Christian, would be non-sectarian, thus attracting a far more diverse student body than any other mission school at the time. In fact, in 1903, while chartering the college, local board members carefully eschewed naming it American or Protestant, opting instead, instead for the more inclusive international college. They also underlined that the college was open to boys and young men of every nationality and religion. And they meant this to facilitate the attendance of Muslim boys who in the early years of the college were not allowed to attend a Christian school, McLaughlin allowed their access to a back door in a blind alley, hidden from the view of the police station located just across the college's main gate. Recalling this means of evasion, years later, McLaughlin admitted that it made possible the attendance and final graduation of the most brilliant student we ever graduated. So what had started out as a strategy for survival created a unique social environment at the college. If in the first two years, the student body was exclusively Armenian in subsequent years, and especially when enrollment hit the 400 mark in 1913, it became more accurately representative of Izmir's plural demographics. With the majority of Greeks, and we're talking about 50% Greeks in that case, and a diverse mix of Turks, about 20% Turks, 10% Armenians, 5% Jews, and 10% of others that include Protestants, and Catholics, and whatnot, the college actually offered a distinctively diverse learning environment, becoming a training ground for culturally proficient and educated personnel for local commercial enterprises. Eliminating the primary, eliminating the primary classes altogether, which had made the focus of prior American missionaries, McLaughlin established a four-year collegiate curriculum preceded by up to four years of prep school, which on the whole provided a practical yet academically rigorous education in languages, arts, and science. Like its more established counterparts in Izmir, the college offered a multilingual education, wherein both high proficiency English and French language were compulsory. But it also established Greek and Armenian preparatory sections. And when the official ban on Muslim attendance was lifted in 1909, a Turkish prep section to facilitate the entry of students from different linguistic and educational backgrounds, it was a major departure from the American board template, at least as far as I know it. The college also offered both commercial and arts and sciences diplomas, surpassing other establishments in its inclusive and flexible curriculum. Most distinctively, the curriculum placed great emphasis on hands-on learning, practical demonstrations, and instruction. In addition to the weather station and the seismograph that I already mentioned, the college owned sample collections of metals, minerals, and fossils for use in science courses, owned a telescope, a wireless telegraph, as well as typewriters for training students in the commerce track. The Paradiso campus also boasted expanded labs as well as shops for woodwork, metalwork, printing, and mechanics. 
perhaps most illustrative in this regard, were the scientific farming skills, from animal husbandry and insect control to farm management that the college taught when it started offering an agricultural diploma in 1921, which, considering its location in the most commercialized agricultural region of the empire, appropriately dovetailed with the industrial interests of the local elites. Beyond the academic program, a variety of innovative extracurricular activities stimulated productive exchanges with the local community, earning the college a unique and distinctive place in the city. The earliest and longest lasting was the athletic field day that McLaughlin initiated in 1892 on the second year of the school's existence. In an effort to give visibility to the school and generate enthusiasm for field and track sports among his own students, McLaughlin organized an athletic contest open to the various government and community schools in Izmir. Held that year in a suburban field in Bornaba, the event drew over 4,000 spectators, including the governor of Izmir, testifying to the fruitful collaboration that McLaughlin spearheaded, with local businesses funding the prizes, the Izmir Kasaba Railway Company providing special excursion trains, the local press advertising the event, and the largest schools in Izmir partaking in the event, not to mention the brass band of the Collège de Sacré-Cœur furnishing it with music. Importantly, the field day turned into an annual event, exemplifies how McLaughlin built on the growing receptivity to the healthy body, healthy mind approach that was already kind of introduced to embed the college in his meal. Um, let me also add, I said it would become an annual event and already the following year, there was also an additional event that was added to the panoply of performances in Izmir, and that was the Pan-Hellenic League that was developed uh, soon after that. Now, other forms of local engagement and volunteer work undertaken by student groups further fostered the town and gown relationship. In addition to a wide range of students and clubs, social work and community outreach programs gained momentum after the college moved its new campus and especially during the Great War and the years leading, leading to the Turkish Republic. I truly am going to finish. For example, the pioneering social settlement house of Prophet Elias, a community service project for the poor Greek village neighboring, um, for the poor Greek village neighboring the campus, began in 1915 and was actually dedicated by the Greek Metropolitan of Izmir in 1921 conceived as a laboratory for practical community involvement and erected and staffed by college students, the social center supported relief work for the men, women, and children of the village while also showcasing the college as a good citizen locally. Similarly, to encourage outreach projects targeting Muslim communities, the college helped set up a YMCA branch in the Turkish Quarter under the direction of John Birch who had been recently hired by the college precisely to liven up extracurricular activities. Initiated in this case by a former graduate of the college, Sherif Remzireyan, who eventually joined the local board of directors and other Turkish teachers of the Izmir Sultani School, the YMCA branch established in 1920 in a rented 12-room house near the bazaar in close vicinity of stores and coffee shops, offered educational and sports programs, language instruction, social activities, and the children's club. Such initiatives, short-lived as they may have been, were nonetheless important means for the continual reassertion of the college within the life of the city. So I'm going to wrap up. Now, this distinctive modus operandi that admitted innovation, changes, adjustments, helped the college weather, albeit temporarily, the dramatic social and political changes during the early Republican era. Indeed, if the international college were to continue its educational mission under the new Turkish regime, it had to reorganize its curriculum radically from foundation to capstone. In 1923, when it reopened its doors after a year of closure, the college had almost entirely lost its non-Muslim student body and faculty. Additionally, compelled by the new regime to fully secularize its curriculum adapted and adapted to the regulations and restrictions of the national system of education, the administration undertook a series of changes. Among these were the categorical elimination of the daily chapel service and Bible study held at the auditorium, which had been a constant and integral part of the life of the college since its inception, and the expansion of the Turkish curriculum and faculty, often drawing on their own alumni. 
pursuing a policy of ready and friendly conformity with government guidelines, the college also did its fair share of work in running night school classes as early as 1923. Uh, and these were later known as Militnik, um, teaching reading and writing skills in Turkish, as well as subjects such as history, geography, and citizenship to persons employed by day. The service conformed well to the college's long established practice of expanding its facilities for community benefit. Further, to counter the climate of rising anti-foreign sentiments and cultivate greater exchange between Turkish and foreign cultures, the college also established an Institute of Turkish Studies in 1929, aimed at promoting a fuller understanding of Turkish life and thought. And beginning in 1931, it also housed the Anatolia Rural Life Institute, funded by the Marist Foundation for Rural Betterment. I also want you to note, uh, I entirely forgot to switch the slide. Um, I want you also to note the kind of the Turkish student publication, uh, the Shik, which is lights playing on the theme of enlightenment, but in this case, it's totally Turkicized. Now, and yet, despite its remarkable resilience, the college administration could not stop or dispel the growing anti foreign and national sentiments that were dominant at the time. In 1934, a contentious student disciplinary case that made the headlines half its half is its enrollment, causing drastic losses of funding. Unable to, finance, uh, to financially support the campus anymore, the local administration eventually decided to close its doors. Now, more than this one incident that was usually pointed out as the reason for the closure, however, which no doubt dealt the final blow to the college, it was the gradual loss of its vital local sponsors and the steady dismantling of Ottoman Izmir's entrepreneurial class during the first decade of the new regime that brought the college's end. So ingrained had the institution become in the plural environment of the Ottoman city that the severing of this relationship became weaker. But let me end with a brighter note, actually. Uh, closure, of course, did not diminish the college's manifold legacy. So if we take a quick look at the International College's roster of alumni, which includes the likes of former President Adnan Menderes, pharmaceutical magnet Nejat Ibzajibashiv, these are first that may, uh, names that may resonate with the Turks, um, and also the founder of Hajetepe and Dilkant University, Sandor Amadji. You know, all these examples surface to show the college's role in training the next generation of leaders. And on the American side, the work of McLaughlin's descendants, like his grandson Howard Reed, a founding member of the Middle East Studies Association in 1966, and of the Turkish Studies Association in 1971, exemplifies the continued contributions of the college to the educational mission. And last but not least, and perhaps most pertinent for our discussion, aspects of the curriculum, especially the agricultural program and social work, as well as the campus facilities themselves were taken over by the Turkish government to be used as a village institute, the Kuzulçuluk Institute, between 1936 and 1939.